she is. Is she, Joan has been part of the COMPASS study since uh, before the grant writing. She was um, involved in some of the initial thinking and feedback to the clinicians here at Wake Forest, where her husband, uh, a physician here at the medical center, was treated after his stroke. She is a retired middle school teacher, and she often credits her ability to advocate um, um, due to her position as a middle school teacher. She's been a very <laughs> fierce advocate for, um, for Dr. Celestino during his recovery, and in particular while he was working through aphasia. So Joan has been um, heavily involved in training our post-acute care teams at the intervention sites. And uh, she was such a hit that when the control sites switch over to implementing COMPASS, you will meet her in person as well. And she's also been very involved in uh, developing the handouts that we have created for providers on communication, how to communicate with um, patients after they've suffered a stroke. Um, and so one, one thing we have learned in sort of our listening to stakeholders throughout the study design is that everybody has a different perspective. And um, one thing that our stroke survivors highlighted very, very quickly was that currently the standard of care tends to forget family members and doesn't support them um, the way they need, to, they need to be supported. They are, they are sort of worn out um, in their caregiving duties. Um, in many cases, they themselves um, or elderly or of poor health, and taking on the responsibility of caring for a spouse is tremendous. Um, and it's our, it's, it was our stroke survivors that, that brought our attention to family members much more clearly than family members did. Our family members were constantly focused on the patient's needs, and the patients were the ones that kept saying, don't forget my caregiver, don't forget my caregiver. It's actually in my best interest if you also support my caregiver. <laughs> and so, Joan, why don't you just share briefly um, your thoughts on why it's so important to um, care? I know this, you, you are, you are a, a loud advocate for patients, but also for other caregivers across North Carolina. If you could highlight for all the um, uh, members on the call why it's so important that we capture the caregiver's perspective in our survey as part of the study design. Well, I think my husband and I had um, probably a, a different picture than some others. We were fairly healthy right at about 60 years old. Um, and uh, my husband coughed too hard, had uh, bilateral dissection of his carotids. And uh, they were happily able to save his life, but he did have a stroke. And from the point that that happened, for quite a few months, even though he understood what was going on slowly, um, and he began to get his ability to move back, he was not able to control his re rehabilitation. He had to have somebody strong who could see what was going on and move towards the determination that he could then produce. And so I think when we think about um, people with stroke uh, being uh, discharged from the hospital or from rehab, and they come home, their success is maybe at the very beginning totally in the hands of their caregivers, because the caregiver is the one who makes sure that the medicine uh, regimen is followed. They make sure that they get to the rehab things they need to do. They need to um, be right there for them to make sure any physical practice or occupational therapy, the practice is done at home. So it's really at that beginning part, really for the first three months, it is totally who is driving the, um, the rehab. And that is something that is sometimes missed. Certainly, the patient should be the center of everything. But what happens is the, pa the patient often doesn't really know how to organize all of that. 
And so I think what's happening is there is a, um, a, a drop from the caregivers, in, from the, uh, the hospital caregivers, between that and the actual family caregiver. Um, now, in our situation, I was teaching middle school. I was happily able to find a couple of sort of underemployed people in my church. And they came and uh, were with my husband while he um, needed somebody 24-7. And then I came home from my job and continued it. But the determination to succeed really came from me. And so it is critical that anybody talking about stroke realizes that the support and the resources at the beginning need to be really fully behind the caregiver. And you know, it, as we've gone along, my husband has now done wonderfully. He um, happily talks about his golf game approaching, at least he's under 90 now, and so he's very pleased with that. But the major thing is now he can have goals and drive that. But at the beginning, it was in my hands. So, Sabina, do you want me to Yes, want to and, and so I know at the beginning or? he was told he wouldn't um, be playing golf again, and so you, you've come such a tremendous way. And I do want to highlight, this is something Joan has said herself, that she and her husband were in a unique position compared to most um, families, and that they were um, highly educated and had high income and access to resources that um, most people probably didn't have. And despite those advantages, it's a tremendous, tremendous um, burden to overcome. And one one last person who has said this to me is the um, Betsy Vetter, who's the head of governmental affairs for the American Heart Association here in North Carolina. And she she is probably one of the most resourced, um, knowledgeable people um, around stroke. And when she was faced with having to care for her husband after his stroke, she said she was completely overwhelmed. And so you have these highly um, motivated, highly engaged, highly resourced individuals um, who are overwhelmed. And so when you consider the average um, uh, family, the, the burden can truly seem overwhelming. And you did, you mentioned this before, but also the health of the caregiver mm -hmm. in addition right. to the health of the patient mm -hmm. is terrifically and, important. Yes. And so this is, this is why um, when we intervene um, through the COMPASS intervention and, and elements of assessing um, comprehensively how the patient is doing is pivoting to the caregiver and, and going through a battery of questions with them to understand what their needs are to care for um, the, the patient. Because just exactly as you, as you said, Joan, they are really driving rehab um, initially. Right. Joan, this is Laurie. We have some really amazing uh, nurses that are working at the usual care sites across the um, state. And I just um, wanted to give you that little feedback and ask all the folks that are on the call who actually have phone access and don't have technical difficulties, <laughs> if you have some okay. questions. In particular, I was thinking when you um, interact with um, your patients and caregivers, do you have some questions for Joan that you think might give a little insight on um, that interaction? Okay, hearing none, um, uh, Joan, do you have any other um, thoughts you want to share about the, um, the importance of uh, having the uh, nurses and, and the hospital staff, you know, touch base with the um, caregivers? Well, I, I think that, that um, stroke is a, a devastating um, condition. And to recover from it requires a tremendous amount of hope 
and determination. And it is always everybody's goal to infuse that into the stroke survivor. But it is critical that somebody help get that into the caregiver as well. And I think that the medical community is much, um, is, is really too afraid to give hope. And I think that it would, it, it's a, it's, it, it, the only way caregivers can go on is if they think there is hope. And so uh, they need to, to um, know, understand where somebody might be able to move and how they will be able to move forward. And also the idea that um, stroke improve, uh, improvement after stroke can go on for years and years and years. So um, my husband is now four and a half years out, and um, he has pretty good movement, but his hand was still a little bent. Well, he decided he'd go to acupuncture. And, you know, that's now improved. And at each stage, we visit people and they say, oh, you are so much better than you were last year. So his attitude is totally, his attitude of what he can do and how it will be in the future is totally defined by the recognition that improvement continues. And so I think that that's a, a critical aspect of dealing with um, the stroke survivors, but also with the, the uh, caregivers themselves. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joan. I um, distinctly remember uh, your presentations at the boot camp, and I felt confident that all of uh, these amazing um, nurses that I have the great good fortune to talk with on a monthly basis about COMPASS, I felt like they would also really appreciate hearing your story and get, getting a really good perspective um, from the caregiver. That's really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your time. Well, I'm so glad to help. And do you want me to stay on? If, if you like. I know you've rearranged your day. So if, if yes. I know you have, you've, you've rearranged so that you could be here with us now. And so you are absolutely free to stay, but we, we expect that you'll need to hang up. Okay, well, I'll go on, on somebody's taking my volunteer job and, and I'll go back and take it away from her and take it back. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. It's so, really wonderful. Okay, it's great to be with you all and uh, I'm delighted uh, at, and so thankful for all of you and for all of your work. Thanks very much. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye. So now, um, Sabina, can you share a little bit um, from your perspective uh, regarding the study and the um, vital importance of the caregiver? Sure. I, let me I'll probably let Barb speak further. But what one thing we do wanted to highlight, right, was the the necessary the, the, that it's necessary to to get the caregiver survey completed. Um, because what what makes Compass unusual is that it's 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 assessing the needs of um, the family member caring for the patient in addition to the patient, and so we we want it's our secondary outcome that we reduced family strain um, through the Compass intervention, and so it's it's absolutely important that we get the surveys that we're mailing out to uh, patients across the state. I'm sorry, to the families across the state, return to us in a higher, um, a higher rate than has happened so far. But um, we should turn the, the phone over to Barb, too. OK, awesome. Um, and Barb, because of all the kerfuffle that happened a few minutes ago, I don't know if I, um, if I was, well, I know I wasn't able to introduce you. But um, just in case, um, for everyone that's out there, um, we are very fortunate. Well, I introduced in I introduced myself, Lori. Okay. I introduced myself. <laughs> okay. okay, Barb, that's awesome. So, now, if, um, whoever's got the screen, if you can put the slides up, and then I'll just tell you when to go to the next slide. How would that be? Cool. That's perfect. I'll do that right now. Thanks. 
Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be on the call. Um, I've been involved in Compass uh, since it got funded, and so and have done a lot of work around caregivers um, and the importance of assessing not only the patient but the caregiver. So that's uh, what we just wanted to talk to you briefly about today. Uh, on top of what Joan has already shared with you. So next slide. So as Sabina just said, uh, in addition to the focus on the stroke survivors and, and the outcomes that we're looking at for the stroke survivors, we're also um, looking at provide at outcomes related to caregivers particularly around strain or burden and so um, in the in the intervention we do have um, some mechanisms to provide some support to this to the caregivers uh, through providing uh, resources um, and and information on the compass website and then at the end at the 90 days we do um, an assessment of what kind of caregiving they're doing and um, and then do this caregiver strain index and that's the the survey that gets sent out at 90 days next slide please so um, the caregivers are contacted by um, compass personnel um, when the patient's discharged to try to get reliable contact information and, and their relationship to the patient. And so that's something that we hope you all are able to do is to get us the most reliable um, information you can related to that. We know sometimes those people change, like you might have a an adult daughter that's providing care and then maybe as the patient gets a little better then then maybe the spouse can take over or maybe there's not somebody that's doing much of the care anymore but we'd really like to try to capture as many of these as we can and as Sabina mentioned our um, rates of capture haven't been as good as we had hoped so um, again that's one of the things we we wanted to kind of stress so that you can understand the importance of that um, next slide please so the the questionnaire that we send at 90 days um, gets some just demographic kinds of information related to the caregivers and then it does an, we do a brief assessment of um, of the care they're providing and the amount and um, of time and frequency of their um, post-stroke caregiving and then we do this standardized caregiver strain index okay the next slide and, and I, if you can hear that phone in the background, I apologize. Um, so this just gives you, if you can see this, for those of you who can see this, it just it provides a list of the kinds of things that caregivers may be required to do once the patient goes home. So we ask if they're helping. We ask if they need assistance with that. And then we ask also if this was something they were doing prior to stroke, because we got some feedback from some of the caregivers that they this was not a new task for them. They had always helped with driving, or they'd always helped with preparing meals, or, or the housework, or whatever. So, um, so we wanted to make sure that we were able to separate that out. So this is, this is the survey that gets sent out. This is part of it. And then um, next slide. And this is the caregiver strain index. This is a standardized tool that uh, is available. It's, uh, it's a validated tool, and I think it's about 12 or 15 items. It's pretty easy um, for them to fill out. And it, uh, like I said, it's been validated in uh, studies with stroke patients before. So uh, this is what we're asking them, again, to, um, to complete. And, and when they get that 90-day questionnaire. Next slide. So as Sabina mentioned, we've had a really low response rate. Um, and so we're really trying to figure out some mechanisms to try to improve that, uh, especially um, with the usual care sites, because we, we have so such limited contact, both with the stroke survivors and their caregivers. And so we think some of these are potential explanations, that the caregivers don't think that this pertains to them, uh, that if the patient uh, that doesn't have a lot of functional limitations and they don't require extensive or long-term caregiving, then the caregiver may think, well, I don't need to fill this out because it, you know, it's not applicable. Uh, or that they were providing similar care before the stroke and 
now after and so they think well this isn't any different so why would I fill this out or again as the care the caregivers may change over um, from the time of discharge to when we send the follow-up so next slide um, what we're really interested in is any ideas you can give us to um, uh, to try to better get these you know try to engage these caregivers or things you can think about to make sure that you really connect with them uh, before they're discharged so that when we send the 90-day survey we do get it back um, and you can also emphasize the importance you know reminding them that they will be getting this and would they please send it back in or or tell the, the patients if they're able to understand um, you know that this survey will be coming out and could they please encourage the caregivers to complete it for us so I don't, I'm hoping some of you will also have some suggestions about how we can um, better capture this, you know, get the caregivers to, to complete this tool that we send out. So I'm going to turn it back over to Lori, and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Well, I'm going to give everybody a minute to think about all the um, great information that's been shared in the hopes that uh, it will percolate a few questions or just points for discussion. As you all may remember, uh, last month on our call, uh, we had some folks from the sites share their success stories. And um, someone uh, mentioned that they find that the uh, conversations with caregivers is pretty easy and straightforward. So I'm going to just ask everybody to um, Step up to the phone and share your perspectives. That'd be that'd be wonderful because um, the purpose of these calls again is for us all to learn together, and um, that's only possible if we all um, do a little talking. Thanks. Okay, so uh, this is Laurie again. <laughs> so I'm uh, taking your silence to mean that you are going to be thinking about this and uh, may send emails and so forth later uh, because I know this was, um, from my perspective, very helpful information. So the other thing that I wanted to then do is to transition to the next part of our agenda which was to thank everyone for completing this monthly survey. And uh, we only had one response um, that there's, there were, everybody uh, was very kind to share and so forth. But there was one I just wanted to sh um, share with the whole group. And that is um, for one of the sites that uh, there was some difficulty with patients that were discharged home uh, trying to identify those but they found that that has improved uh, since incorporating the use of admission and OBS with the ICD-9 codes. And a lot of people are also finding that working with case managers has also been a big help. So I'm going to um, give another moment of silence and see if anybody else has anything that they want to share. This is Misha. Um, I thought those presentations were really great, so um, thanks for, for doing that. Um, I just wanted to offer, um, and Lori, you know, you may have already done this, but um, if it's helpful for folks, we could send them the current version of the full caregiver survey just to make sure that they've um, seen it and to kind of give a flavor of um, all of the questions and the layout, um, and that might help with um, generating some feedback and ideas and um, just wanted to throw that out there and in case that would be helpful for for folks and maybe Lori you've already done that I haven't shared it with everybody um, there have been a few that have requested it and I've sent it out but that would be a good idea to just um, send it to all the usual care sites this is Barb again that's a really great idea um, and this would be an opportunity too for um, when when you're meeting with the patients 
before discharge to show them what the survey looks like so that when it comes it won't be and if the, especially if the caregivers are there or someone from the family is there you can say now we're going to be sending this to this person you've identified and if that changes uh, be sure if you could to give it to the right person so that and ask them tell them how important it is to fill this out um, one of the things that we hear in our research is how caregivers do feel like they're kind of eclipsed in this whole process that they um, that that some people like providers the, the their primary care providers when the patient gets home um, don't ask how they're doing or aren't concerned about their needs and this is a way to demonstrate also to them that we do care about um, what's going on with them so I think it's a nice way to um, tell them that we're thinking about them as well as the patient and that's something that that doesn't happen as often uh, as we um, hope hope or wish it would and and are trying to move that forward so I just wanted to add that thanks Barb I think those are great tips I'm give it one more moment of silence Anybody else have any thoughts they want to share? Well, this is Sylvia, and I'd just like to thank our presenters, um, as well as you, Laurie, for facilitating again. And this is um, such great information that I think we should also um, share it with our intervention site, um, because we want to make sure that we're improving the rate of return of the caregiver survey in those sites as well. So. You guys are leading the way, and um, with the helpful information we receive back, we can certainly share with our intervention sites, too. So thank you very much. Okay, everybody. Well, um, if, if we don't have any uh, burning questions, then I'm going to um, say good afternoon, and thanks so much for your time, and I look forward to any questions, thoughts, that you might have about um, this important topic. And after we hang up, I'll be sending out that caregiver survey. Alrighty, have a great afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Lori.